Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 47th webinar in the Offshore Wind Series, Learning from the Experts. I am Jana Herndon, a Senior Project Manager with NYSERDA's Offshore Wind Team, and it's my pleasure to be joined by today's experts, William Bailey, Benjamin Kotz, and Pamela Dopart with Exponent. Before I introduce our speakers, a few reminders for participants and some background on this webinar series. Next slide, please. Firstly, if you're experiencing any technical issues, please contact Adam Hauk at the email address on the bottom of this slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation slides for all webinars in the Learning from the Experts series are available on NYSERDA's website at the address on this slide. All participants have been muted. We will have time for questions and answers following the presentation, so please use the Q&A function in WebEx to submit your questions to all panelists. That will ensure that we see all of your questions. Next slide, please. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is a critical component in achieving the state's goal of 70% renewable sources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. To provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible, impartial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics of interest, NYSERDA is hosting this educational webinar series called Learning from the Experts to connect the public with independent experts in key topics in offshore wind. We endeavor to select Learning from the Experts speakers based on their expertise, not necessarily for an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA or the state of New York. If you would like to suggest a topic or speaker for a future webinar, you can email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov or fill out a survey also available on our website. Please note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers from Exponent, a nationally recognized scientific and engineering firm. Dr. Bill Bailey specializes in applying state-of-the-art assessment methods to environmental and occupational health issues. His 30 years of training and experience include health risk assessments, comprehensive exposure analyses, and more. Dr. Bailey has investigated exposures to alternating current, direct current, and radio frequency electromagnetic fields, stray voltage, and electrical shock, as well as to a variety of chemical agents and air pollutants. Dr. Bailey has worked on nearly a dozen different offshore wind projects. Dr. Ben Kotz has extensive experience in modeling, measuring, and analyzing magne magnetic fields and induced electric fields, including those from subsea AC and DC transmission lines. His experience includes field assessments of interarray and export cables, as well as at wind turbine generators and offshore substation platforms cable and pipeline crossings, and unburied portions of cables with protective coverings. Dr. Kotz has worked on more than a dozen different offshore wind projects. Dr. Pamela Dopart is an environmental and occupational health scientist and industrial hygienist. Her work includes assessing exposures to electromagnetic fields, including those associated with AC and DC power line transmission, uh, power lines, uh, transmission lines, in relation to potential human health effects and in communicating the scientific research on EMF and health to the public. Prior to joining Exponent, Dr. Dopart was at the National Cancer Institute, during which her research focused on improving methods for assessing occupational and environmental exposures for epidemiologic studies of cancer. Thank you for joining us. I will now hand things over to our speakers. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. Uh, this is William Bailey. And I'll start things off. Next slide. Uh, our firm Exponent is a multidisciplinary engineering and scientific firm dedicated to solving important science, engineering, and regulatory issues for clients. Uh, our 
my experience and that of my colleagues includes the preparation or review of environmental assessments for onshore and offshore generation and transmission projects in the US, Canada, and Europe. We have assisted the federal government, utilities, infrastructure developers, including offshore projects, municipalities, and state regulatory agents. In our webinar today, we've making a presentation that is general in scope and based upon scientific and technical references cited and not any specific project. Next slide. Well, many of you may be quite familiar with the offshore wind farm technology. In this webinar, we're going to focus principally on aspects of the transmission of electricity onshore. To set the stage for my colleagues, we'll discuss the details of the technology and health research on magnetic fields further. I am going to describe the types of magnetic fields associated with the transmission of electricity, the dominant characteristics of these fields, other common sources of fields in our environment, and what components of typical wind farm projects in the US are sources of magnetic fields. Next slide. Next slide. The question is, does electricity generated by offshore wind farms affect magnetic field exposure onshore? We want to share with you what you need to know. My next few slides will begin to answer this question. Next slide. To start, it is important to understand that there are currently two systems for the transmission of electricity from an offshore wind farm to the onshore electrical grid. Both achieve the same purpose, but with some differences in technology. The starting point of both systems, however, is the same. Offshore wind farm uh, turbines generate alternating current or AC electricity, as I refer to, with a frequency of 60 Hertz. This electricity is just like that used everywhere in our community. In the first and most common system for transmitting electricity ashore, the AC electricity flows from wind turbines over cables of different sizes and voltages all the way to the final point of interconnection with the local electric system, all as AC electricity. In the second delivery system, AC electricity from the wind turbines is converted to DC electricity, the same electricity as comes from a car battery, and at off converted at an offshore converter station to direct current, which is then transmitted electrically all the way to land, where on shore it is converted back to AC before connecting to the local electrical grid. Magnetic fields are conducted are created around conductors carrying electricity. So where transmission conductors carry AC electricity, AC magnetic fields are created. And where DC electricity is carried, DC magnetic fields are created. Electric fields are not discussed here in the webinar because no significant electric field is created by the voltage applied to underground cables because of insulation around the cables and shielding by the earth. Only overhead lines are capable of producing overhead uh, electric fields in air. Next slide. Now the differences between magnetic fields from AC and DC cables are due entirely to their frequency. Frequency refers to the number of times per second that the field changes direction. Second, we measure the fields in units of Hertz. Referring to the diagram on the screen, we see at the left, the constant direction of a horizontal line representing the DC magnetic field 
labeled with a frequency of zero hertz. As the number of oscillations of the field per second increases, the frequency of the field increases. Magnetic fields of different frequencies are produced by different sources in our environment, but most importantly, the frequency of a magnetic field determines how it interacts with the environment, including people. Next slide. This slide shows the wide range of frequencies uh, in our natural environment and also highlights fields produced by various man-made sources. Looking at the top of the slide, although it may be hard to see, we see the frequency expressed in multiples of 10. We are interested here for the purpose of this webinar only at the frequencies at the far left part of the screen, that is at zero hertz or at 60 hertz. The frequency of magnetic fields from AC power systems are at 50 or 60 hertz. Power systems in Europe have a dominant frequency of 50 hertz, while those in North America, our electricity is transmitted at a dominant frequency of 60 hertz. While there are many sources of higher frequency fields, so they're shown on the right of the screen in our environment, these have very different properties because they oscillate many thousands to billions of times per second, including radio frequency fields from cell, cell telephones, visible light, and at still higher frequencies, the fields have so much energy that they are referred to as ionizing radiation because they are only capable of breaking only these fields at that, those frequencies are capable of breaking electrons from atoms. Next slide. This slide illustrates the generation of electricity offshore and how it is transmitted by buried undersea cables and then underground cables to shore. In this illustration of an AC transmission system, AC electricity from the turbines is collected from multiple interarray cables at an offshore substation where the voltages of the electricity is increased for more efficient transport over offshore export cables for the long distance to shore. Typically, the connection between the offshore export cables and onshore underground cables is made by passing the cables through conduit tubes deep underneath the ground by a technique called horizontal directional drilling, or HDD. The virtue of HDD is that the cables are protected from damage and avoid any disturbance to the shore above. An illustration of a DC system would look very similar to that shown here on the screen, except that the AC electricity would collect at an offshore converter station where the AC electricity would be converted to DC electricity. The advantage of shipping DC electricity to shore is that the loss of voltage and power over long distances is much less than for AC electricity. Next slide. This slide focuses just on the onshore transmission of electricity from a wind farm. Here we see how the HDD cables pass deep under the shore landing and then going further onshore, rise to burial depths more typical of underground utilities, such as for electric water and sewer. At this point, the HDD cables are connected to onshore export cables installed in concrete duct banks for the protection of the cables. For an AC only system shown here, the onshore cables will typically terminate at the project's onshore substation where the voltage of the electricity is increased. From the onshore substation, the AC electricity is carried over an underground interconnection line to a utility substation or transmission line where the incoming electricity now exactly matches the frequency and the voltage of the electricity at which the transmission system operates. For DC cables coming ashore from a wind farm, 
the route is very similar to what is shown here, except that the DC cables would terminate at an onshore converter station where the DC electricity is converted back to AC electricity or transmission underground to the local utility grid. Next slide, please. Besides the AC and DC cables from offshore wind farms, I have listed other common sources of DC and AC fields. For DC fields is on the left, the principal source is the natural geomagnetic field of the earth. This is the, uh, the field that causes a compass to port to point in a north-south direction. Man-made sources of DC magnetic fields include electromagnetic fields and audio headphones and telephones, permanent magnets on our refrigerators and children's toys, and the magnetic resonance imaging devices to use very strong DC magnetic fields uh, as part of a medical diagnostic tool. And to round out the list, I note that modern DC overhead transmission lines on shore have been built in the US, Canada, and Europe uh, since the 1970s. On the right-hand side of the slide are a listing of common sources of AC magnetic fields, which commonly referred to as EMF. You may be more familiar with these because many of these uh, devices and appliances are found in our own homes. They are often, those appliances are often the strongest sources of AC fields that we may encounter. Depending upon the grounding system of houses and other buildings, the current flow on grounding systems can also be an important background source of magnetic field exposure. Finally, overhead and underground lines that distribute AC electricity to our homes, schools, and workplaces, and the transmission lines sharing electricity over large areas are sources of AC magnetic fields. Next slide. As by now, some of you may be overwhelmed by all the information that I have shared, but my colleagues, I hope, will clarify further. But you should understand that you are not alone in being overwhelmed by information. There are many challenges to understanding magnetic fields. First, there are tens of thousands of studies in the published literature on all aspects of magnetic fields. It is a vast and complex body of literature. Next, magnetic fields are difficult for us to conceptualize because we cannot see, touch, or feel at levels found in our environment. Confusion also arises for the public and some scientists too because of the mistaken idea that because something at one frequency is labeled as a magnetic field or EMF, means that fields at other frequencies share the same characteristics. As I just discussed before, this is an inappropriate conclusion. Even before the internet became a source of information, newspapers, books, and other media, not written by engineers and scientists, became a source of misinformation, principally because of confusing research about magnetic fields at one frequency with that at another frequency. Recently, a homeowner told me about a news report she had read that mentioned a study of magnetic fields in 1979. Everyone should recognize that science and research advances every year, and the research published back then may not accurately portray what we know about magnetic fields today, particularly as to fast-moving areas of research on health. Finally, an untrained reader may misunderstand many technical studies and not appreciate how the strength and limitations of each study determines what kind of belief and trust we should give to the results of a single study or even a group of studies. This is ex exacerbated when a person is fixated on an idea or belief and then only searches and considers information that confirms that belief 
while ignoring information that is inconsistent. We call that selection of evidence cherry picking. Now I'm going to turn to my colleague, Dr. Kotz, to explain in greater detail the characteristics of AC and DC magnetic fields produced by onshore AC and DC cables and how common technology designs minimize magnetic fields around these sources. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. So with that background, I think it's important to start understanding what exactly are electric and magnetic fields. And as Dr. Bailey described, there are properties of space that surround anything that generates, transmits, or uses electricity. Now we're gonna spend most of our time today looking at the power lines kind of in that transmission category. But it's also important to understand, especially for context, that a lot of the electric and magnetic fields that we encounter in daily life come from those things that use electricity, kind of on the bottom layer of this, this graphic. And essentially anything that plugs into the wall is going to be a source of AC electric and magnetic fields. And anything that plugs into an adapter that you would then plug in, something like a, a cell phone or a laptop that has that AC-DC adapter, those are going to be sources of DC magnetic fields. Next slide, please. The other important aspect to cover is the difference between underground and overhead power lines. And as uh, Dr. Bailey just described, overhead lines, such as the one in the bottom left corner here, uh, those large metal structures, as well as the small wood pole distribution lines that we see lining many of our streets are sources of both magnetic fields and electric fields. In contrast, the underground and submarine cables that are typically used as part of offshore wind projects are either buried in a single cables uh, submarine or they're in duct banks. And the construction of those cables and the burial below ground will prevent any electric fields uh, above trace levels from being measured above ground. So we're going to be talking about just magnetic fields for the rest of the way. Next slide, please. So some properties of magnetic fields um, are, are shown here. They're produced by the flow of electric current. That is, when electricity is flowing, then there's going to be a magnetic field. And from all sources, the magnetic field will decrease pretty quickly with distance away from the source. And we'll get into a few of those examples coming up. And other important aspect is that magnetic fields are not blocked by most common objects. Magnetic fields, both AC and DC, are measured in units called milligauss. And while that may not be a very um, well-known unit to most people, I'm going to try and, and put those into context in the coming slides. Uh, but before we do that, I'll talk a little bit more about the difference between AC and DC. Next slide, please. To illustrate a little bit further the difference between AC and DC electricity, as well as AC and DC magnetic fields, I have the two graphs shown here. Uh, both graphs show the strength and direction of the electricity or the field on the vertical axis and the change in time on the horizontal axis. You can see on the right that the DC electricity and hence the DC magnetic fields does not change with time. It's essentially fixed with time. Whereas on the left, you can see that the AC field changes not just in strength, but also in direction. And in the US and the rest of North America, that strength and direction changes at a rate of 60 times per second. And as Dr. Bailey indicated, that change in frequency or that change in, in direction 60 times per second means that AC fields can induce small voltages and currents in nearby objects, including humans, while the same is not true of DC magnetic fields. Next slide, please. And next slide, thanks. Now, Dr. Bailey already talked about some of the different sources of magnetic fields, uh, so I'm not going to go into those in a lot of detail. Uh, but as he highlighted, AC power lines, particularly those that are associated with the offshore wind projects onshore, are what we're going to be focusing on today. And I'd also like to reiterate uh, something that Dr. Bailey said, which is that uh, 
when you're talking about electric and magnetic fields, or if you hear the term EMF, it's almost certain that you're talking about 60 hertz AC magnetic fields and electric fields. And it's pretty unlikely that you're talking about magnetic fields from DC lines. Next slide, please. So we talked a little bit earlier about the units of how we measure magnetic fields and the unit of milligauss. And what I'm hoping to do here is to provide a little bit of context for instance, if I said to somebody that I've got a bag that's 25 pounds or it's 70 degrees outside, most people are going to understand pretty well how heavy that bag is or how warm or cold it is outside. But there's not really much understanding of what the strength of magnetic field means. And so the hope is that this slide will help provide some of that context. And then we can use that as a basis of comparison for the fields that we're going to be talking about from uh, AC and DC lines from the power grid and offshore wind coming up. The graph here shows measured magnetic field levels from a number of different household sources. And they measured a bunch of different um, units from each of these. And what's shown here is the median, which means that half of the units measured had higher field levels and half of them had lower field levels. And what this graph shows is not just the field at a particular distance, but also how it decreases with increasing distance away from the source. So for instance, if you look at a hair dryer, uh, a typical usage distance might be about six inches. And at that distance, the magnetic field strength is about 300 milligauss. Whereas if you look at it at a foot away, it's dropped off to about one milligauss. And at two feet away, it's basically below the background levels. Another example might be a vacuum cleaner, which similarly has a magnetic field level of um, six inches away of about 300 milligauss. But people don't typically use vacuums that close to themselves. They're gonna be a foot or two away, at which distance the field levels have dropped to 60 or 10 milligauss respectively. Next slide, please. So that decrease in distance from uh, a source is also applicable to power lines. And what I'm showing here is how the field level decreases with distance away from uh, overhead or underground power lines. The graph shows the strength of the magnetic field on the vertical axis and the distance away from the source on the horizontal axis, which uh, with, with the center or zero being the, the center line of the respective source. And the example here is for an underground duct bank as shown by the inset on the left and an overhead line as shown by the inset on the right. And you'll notice that the maximum magnetic field level directly above the underground duct bank is a little bit higher than that from the overhead line. And this is pretty common and it's simply a function of how far away from the line you are at that location. Whereas most overhead power lines are constructed at a height of 20 or 30 feet above ground most underground lines are buried to a depth of about three or five feet below ground. So you're simply closer to the lines or the power lines at that location. But this also shows that as you move away from distance, that while the, the magnetic field from the overhead line decreases quickly with distance, the field levels from the underground line decrease more quickly with distance. And this is essentially because the three conductors of the underground transmission line are closer together and the magnetic field created by each of the three conductors cancels out somewhat the field from the other two. So the closer you can bring those conductors together, the lower the field levels will be and the more quickly with distance the fields will drop off. Next slide, please. So with the context of the couple of previous slides on the household items, I'm hoping to, to be able to show what the field levels might be from different types of power lines that you'll see and these AC power lines on shore. And I've broken that into three categories. And you can see the category in the first column and then the next couple of columns show the maximum magnetic field level either above or below the line. The next one is the magnetic field level at a specific distance away, typically referred to as a right-of-way distance for an overhead line. And then what that distance is, is shown on the last column. And the first grouping I have here is distribution lines. And when we're talking about an overhead distribution line, you're looking at something like the wood poles that are gonna be lining the city streets. Um, 
They bring the power to our homes and workplaces. And uh, if you don't happen to see any overhead distribution lines, but your power still turns on when you flip the light switch, then that's a pretty good indication that the, the power bringing electricity to your home or your workplace is underground. And you can see here, kind of as I described on the previous slide, the field levels directly above an underground distribution line are a bit higher than from an overhead line, uh, something on the order of 24 milligauss compared to 12. But as you move away with distance, at a distance of 25 feet away, uh, which might be indicative of where a typical home might be located if the distribution line is right along the sidewalk, maybe a house is something like 25 feet away, that flips a little bit, and the field levels from the distribution line underground are lower, about 2 milligauss, compared to overhead, which will be about 5.5 milligauss. The middle group, uh, shown in purple here, is from a variety of these uh, different voltages of overhead transmission lines. And these are the larger, typically metal structures that are often constructed on dedicated rights of way. And you can see there that the field level directly beneath these AC uh, power lines is a little bit higher, something on the order of 30 to 90 milligauss. And at the edge of the right of way, 50 to 65 feet away, the field levels have dropped to about six and a half up to around 30 milligauss. Lastly, uh, I wanted to talk about the underground lines from offshore wind and what the field levels might be from there. It's important to note that every project is going to be a little bit different, and the details of that project are going to determine exactly what the field levels will be. But as a typical number, you might see something like 57 milligauss directly above the line, and at a distance of 25 feet away, uh, you're going to be seeing something around a little bit more than 3.5 milligauss kind of smack dab in the middle of what you would see from a typical overhead distribution line at about five and a half and an underground distribution line at about two milligauss. Next slide, please. So with the context of what field levels would look like from a couple of sources, I also wanted to end up our discussion of AC magnetic fields by talking about what sort of methods there are for reducing field levels. And there are some pretty well-known methods. The first is to put them underground, and that's because, as we showed before, the closer you get the conductors together, the more quickly with distance the field levels decrease. Other things that can decrease magnetic field levels are increasing the voltage, because for the same amount of power that's transmitted, a higher voltage will lead to a lower current, and hence a lower magnetic field. And you can also increase the burial depth, which will have more of an effect directly above the distribution line or the, the power line, but really won't have as much of an effect, say, 25 or 50 feet away um, as it will directly above. But by far the most effective way of reducing magnetic fields is through a process called phase optimization. And to describe that a little bit further, I'm, I'm sh showing this diagram in the center uh, that shows three different conductors labeled A, B, and C. And this is the designation of what the three conductors of an individual transmission line are called. They're the phase conductors and they're labeled A, B, and C. When you have two different transmission lines in a duct bank, which is often the case with what you might see for an offshore wind project, the orientation of those conductors can matter a lot. And so if we look at the graph on the right side, this is another example of what the field strength might look like as a function of distance away from the center line. And if you see that larger graph, this is a configuration where it has the same phasing for both circuits on, on, the, uh, on each side. So this would be an ABC, ABC configuration. The lower level or the lower graph shows a duct bank which is identical in every possible way, except that instead of having an ABC configuration on both sides, it's ABC on one side and CBA on the other side. So this method of phase optimization can be very effective in reducing magnetic field levels. And as such, it's one that's recognized by the World Health Organization for typical use in AC projects. With that, I'm gonna start talking a little bit more about DC fields. Next slide, please. And next slide. Just to reiterate a little bit, uh, there are many sources of DC magnetic fields, and these fields don't change direction and strength the same way that AC fields do. 
and hence they do not induce those small currents and voltages the way that AC magnetic fields can. Dr. Bailey previously listed a number of these sources, and I'm going to cover each of them in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, next slide, please. The first, as Dr. Bailey indicated, is Earth's geomagnetic field. And as we've heard a couple of times now, this is the most common source of DC magnetic fields on Earth because Earth's magnetic field is literally everywhere. The strength of Earth's magnetic field varies with where you are on Earth as well. At the equator, Earth's magnetic field is about 300 milligauss, whereas at the North and South Poles, it's about 700 milligauss. And obviously anything that has a permanent magnet in it is also going to be a source of DC magnetic field. Next slide, please. A few more examples of DC magnetic fields are shown on this slide. And the first is Earth's magnetic field. And as I said, it varies across the globe, but in New York, the field strength of Earth's magnetic field is about 510 milligauss. Those refrigerator magnets that we've talked about a couple of times might have a magnetic strength of about 100,000 milligauss or more. And of course, the field strength will decrease quickly with distance. The battery operated appliances or electrified railways might be on the order of something like 3,000 to 10,000 milligauss. And the MRI machines that Dr. Bailey discussed um, that are used for diagnosing um, injuries inside the body in a completely non-invasive way are using magnetic fields uh, from, from a DC source. And the strength of those fields is on the order of about 15 to 40 million milligauss. Next slide, please. Like AC fields, the DC magnetic field from power lines can also decrease relatively quickly with distance. And the same sorts of things that you can do for reducing DC magnetic fields are the same, putting them underground, increasing the voltage, and increasing the burial depth. But the biggest factor that determines the strength and how quickly the magnetic field from a DC line will decrease is the separation distance between the two conductors. Now a DC line, instead of having three conductors per Concert, uh, per circuit will have just two, the positive and the negative, just like you would see from a battery. And as shown in the uh, figure on the lower left, the distance between those two conductors has a big effect on the magnetic field strength. The closer together the, conduct, the two conductors are, the lower the DC field will be, and the more quickly with distance it will decrease. And to illustrate that, I have the graph on the right. You can see in the green graph, this is a situation where the positive and the negative conductors of a DC line are completely separated from one another. This results both in a higher field level as well as a, a slower decrease with distance. The purple line shows something like a medium separation distance between the conductors. And the orange line at the very bottom shows what might happen if the two conductors of the line are essentially strapped together uh, so that that's the minimum distance you can have between them. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Dopart, to talk a little bit more about the research of electric and magnetic fields and how those differences between AC fields uh, and exposure are important as it pertains to human health. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so I'll now take us through the remainder of today's presentation. Uh, we'll first discuss the health research related to AC and DC magnetic fields, including how this research is reviewed and evaluated, and the overall conclusions that have been drawn by reputable scientific and health agencies. We'll then talk a bit about the exposure guidelines that have been developed for AC and DC fields. Next slide. And one more, please. So let's start with an overview of how research is evaluated in the scientific community. When we want to find out more information about anything today, many of us search the internet. While fast and convenient, the quality and accuracy of information available is hit or miss and can sometimes be inaccurate or incomplete. That is why when you search for information about any exposure or health outcome, you really wanna get the information from an informed authoritative source that has properly reviewed and evaluated the research in a comprehensive way. Most of the time, the best sources for this information are national and international scientific and health agencies, which have the resources and expertise to perform a deeper dive into the research. 
So what does that process look like? When evaluating the scientific evidence on a topic, these agencies first will convene multidisciplinary panels of experts who will then be tasked with conforming, excuse me, performing a comprehensive assessment of the scientific research. That means that their assessment will involve a review of all the relevant research on the topic. Each study is evaluated for its strengths and limitations, and the results of the studies are assessed together to form an overall conclusion on the scientific evidence for a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. This process, called a weight of evidence review, has some important strengths. For one, when conducting this type of review, the expert panel gives more weight to studies of higher quality, which helps to limit the impact of any significant study limitations. Reviewing all the relevant studies together also prevents studies with a given result from being selectively chosen or removed, that cherry picking that Dr. Bailey described earlier, and reduces the potential for bias. It's also a transparent and consistent process that can be reviewed and reconstructed by others. Next slide, please. And there's another key advantage to the weight of evidence review process. Every published study will have some limitations or weaknesses in its design or methods. And this is true for all three types of studies that are typically conducted and evaluated. Epidemiology studies of human populations, experimental studies of animals, and laboratory studies of human and, or animal cells and tissues. Because of this, conclusions about health risk cannot and should not be drawn from any single study or even a subset of studies. Instead, each individual study and each type of study can be considered one piece of the overall puzzle that when examined together through a comprehensive or weight of evidence review, provides a more complete picture of the true exposure outcome relationship of interest. Next slide, please. So turning now to the health research on EMF specifically. Research on EMF and potential health effects has been ongoing for nearly 50 years now. Over this period, thousands of studies have been published in this area, leading to a very large body of available research. Numerous health and scientific agencies have reviewed the health research on both AC and DC magnetic fields, and many of the reviews published by these agencies are listed in this table. You can see that the research has been reviewed by some of the leading health agencies in the world, including the World Health Organization, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and the US National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. Some of the reviews listed here are specific to either AC or DC fields, while other reviews looked at a range of electromagnetic field frequencies. You can see that some agencies routinely publish evaluations of the most recent research every few years, for example, the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority publishes a new report every one to two years. And when all the agency reviews are taken together, you can see that the research has consistently been reviewed over the span of multiple decades. Many of these agencies have their reports or a summary of their report available to the public for free on their websites. And that would be a great place to start if someone were looking for more information. Next slide, please. I'm now going to talk about the research on AC and DC magnetic fields separately, because as Dr. Bailey and Dr. Kotz discussed, the frequency of magnetic fields determines how it interacts with the environment and with people. Many of the agencies shown on the previous slide have evaluated the research on AC magnetic fields. Their reviews have included hundreds of studies that looked at a variety of study populations and a number of different health outcomes. The conclusions of these agencies have largely been consistent. None have con concluded that AC magnetic fields at the levels we typically encounter throughout our daily lives from all the sources discussed today cause or contribute to adverse health effects. Next slide, please. I did want to talk for a moment about the research on AC magnetic fields in childhood leukemia, as this is an area that folks often have questions about, and it has become a primary focus of AC magnetic fields health research. Among the many studies that have been conducted looking at AC magnetic field exposure and health, some have reported an association between high long-term average exposure to magnetic fields and childhood leukemia. The agencies that have reviewed the research on AC magnetic fields have included these studies as part of their evaluation of the overall scientific evidence on childhood leukemia. And at a high level, this slide summarizes their overall findings and rationale. Regarding the epidemiology studies that reported an association between AC magnetic fields and childhood leukemia, the agencies that have reviewed the research have determined that other factors, including study limitations or biases or even chance, 
could not be excluded as explanations for the observed association. The agencies have also noted that more recent epidemiology studies published on this topic, which overall have been larger studies with improved methodologies, have generally reported weak or no associations with childhood leukemia. In addition, the agencies found that animal studies as a whole do not report adverse effects when the animals are exposed to AC magnetic fields. And based on experimental studies of cells and tissues, no biological mechanism has been identified by which exposure to AC magnetic fields results in cancer development. When all this evidence is taken together, none of the agencies have concluded that AC magnetic fields are a cause of childhood leukemia. And on the slide, you can see one of the agencies that has most recently published a report on the health research on AC fields, Europe's Scientific Committee on Health, Environmental and Emerging Risks, concluded that, quote, overall, there is weak evidence concerning the association of extremely low frequency magnetic fields with childhood leukemia. Next slide, please. Now, turning to DC magnetic fields, uh, similar to that for AC fields, research on DC fields has been extensively published and reviewed by health and scientific agencies. None of these agencies have concluded that exposure to DC magnetic fields, including those related to DC power lines, have any long-term adverse health effects on people. Next slide, please. For the last section of our talk today, I wanna to talk a little bit about exposure limits. Um, exposure limits, whether regulated standards or recommended guidelines, have been developed by governments and scientific and health agencies to protect the public and workers from exposure to agents and activities at levels that may cause serious adverse health effects. In general, in the U.S., there are no federal standards or guidelines for limiting exposure to 60 hertz electric or magnetic fields. Some states have developed their own limits, such as New York, which is listed here. Uh, but these standards have generally been set to maintain field levels from new transmission line projects to the levels produced by existing lines, sometimes referred to as keeping the status quo, and are not based upon health-based risk assessments. Next slide, please. For DC fields, some exposure limits um, have been developed based on extensive research in specific areas. For example, the US Food and Drug Administration has limits for static magnetic fields in MRI machines. In addition, some implanted medical devices, such as pacemakers, that can be affected by DC magnetic fields. Um, this has resulted in some standard setting organizations developing protective standards requiring that such medical devices not be affected by static magnetic fields up to a certain exposure level. Next slide, please. In addition to the limits discussed on the last two slides, there are several internationally recognized guidelines for exposure to both AC and DC fields that have been developed by scientific organizations. Uh, the two organizations listed here, the International Committee on Electromagnetic Safety, or ICES, or the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protect Protection, or ICNRP, developed health-based limits, uh, recommended exposure limits for both workers and the general public based on their review of the health research and on reviews conducted by other health and scientific agencies. And we present those limits here on this slide. Um, if you recall back to Dr. Cox's slides, these limits are much higher than the typical magnetic field levels near power lines, um, AC or DC that Ben showed earlier. Last slide, please. On our final slide, we want to leave you with some quotes taken directly from the World Health Organization's website on EMF, which include, also includes a summary of the research published to date and the WHO's overall findings and recommendations. This quote captures much of what we hope to have conveyed today regarding the health research on EMF. That is, that it is a well-studied topic for which numerous health and scientific agencies have reviewed the research, and that none of these agencies have concluded that AC or DC magnetic fields at the levels we currently experience in our everyday lives are harmful to human health. And you can uh, read the quotes um, at, at your leisure, and we want to thank you for having us today, and um, now we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam, Ben, and Bill for this presentation. A reminder to attendees that you can submit your questions for the speakers through the Q&A function in WebEx. And we do have some questions that have come in already. So I'm gonna, going to start with a two-part question. You spoke to this in your presentation, but if you could reiterate, the question is again, two parts, so bear with me. Uh, is it correct to say that there is not 
EMF from DC cables, it's only from AC cables. And then part two is how will the shift from AC to DC export cables in the future affect EMF impacts and the analysis? Thanks very much, Jenna. Um, I, I'll take that. And, and I think the first question is a little bit tricky and it, and it really does come down to terminology. It's accurate to say that both DC projects as well as AC projects will have electric and magnetic fields, but they're going to be occurring at different frequencies. The DC project will create DC magnetic fields and an AC project will create uh, AC magnetic fields. Uh, as I said during my, my slides, the term EMF uh, is often applied just to AC projects. So if you're reading something and it says EMF, it's probably about AC, but it's a good idea to dig a little bit deeper and confirm for yourself that they are indeed talking about a 60 hertz source versus a zero hertz or DC source. The second part of the question, if we're getting at how things are going to change if, if things shift from an AC to a DC project, uh, I think it comes back to the same idea, which is that there will be AC magnetic fields from an AC project and DC magnetic fields from a DC project. As, as uh, was indicated earlier, a lot of the projects that have been constructed and permitted to date are relatively closer to shore and they have been using AC connections to bring the power ashore. The further you get away from shore, the more difficult it is to bring power over those long distances using AC cables there's more loss uh, with an AC cable. And so the projects that are being built further offshore are tending to become more DC projects, which means that from the future projects, those fields are probably going to be DC magnetic fields rather than the AC compared to what we've been seeing in the past. Thank you. Pam, did you want to speak to the analysis, the comparative analysis of the DC fields and the AC fields in terms of health impacts? Um, you know, I just, I think as we've been pointing out, you know, throughout this presentation is that these, these fields do behave very differently in the way they interact in the environment and, you know, with, with humans and, and animals and, and other uh, test subjects. Uh, um, are, are different, they're, they're not comparable. So you do need to look at the body of research on AC fields separately from the body of research on DC fields. But as we show in the slides here, overall, um, in both cases, you know, these health agencies that have done deep dives into the research in these areas, none have concluded that AC magnetic fields or DC magnetic fields uh, cause or contribute to adverse health effects at the levels that we experience in our everyday lives. Thank you. The next question, the household examples of AC magnetic field sources include items that are inherently turned on and off. Uh, theoretically, an AC offshore wind cable will not turn on and off, but will be constant. Can you provide an example of a constant existing residential AC uh, source of magnetic fields? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's a great question. and, and pointing out the duration of the exposure is an aspect that we didn't have time to get into today, but is absolutely an important one that's looked at by the health and, and safety evaluations and the health research that's gone on. I think the best example for a, an always on uh, residential source is probably the distribution lines that I spoke about on, on one of the previous slides. Uh, if you look out your window and you happen to see those wood poles with, with three conductors or sometimes even one conductor on the top, that's, a, that's the distribution line bringing power to your home or to your workplace. Um, and if you don't, you know, if you happen to live in an area where you look outside and you don't see those wood poles on the street, uh, rest assured that you're still getting power. It's just coming on on an underground distribution line. So I think the, the best context are probably those two sources. And as I described or tried to describe on the, the slide with those, these different sources, uh, the field levels in the street directly above an offshore wind project might be a little bit higher than you would see from a di distribution line. Uh, but those distribution lines are often constructed 
on the sidewalks or very, you know, very near to those sidewalks, a little bit closer to the homes. And so at, at a similar distance away, maybe 25 feet away, the field levels that you'll see from a typical offshore wind project are going to be within the range of what you would expect to see from a distribution line lining the city street. Thank you. Uh, I see some questions about the recording of the webinar and want to reiterate that this webinar recording will be available on NYSERDA's YouTube channel as well as on NYSERDA's webinar and the presentation slides will also be available. We have a question here that says oftentimes some folks bring up the amount of megawatts that underground transmission lines will carry as a key factor. Um, so 400 megawatts versus a 50 megawatt. Um, does that make a difference in creating more or less of a magnetic field? That's another great question. And, and this is another area we didn't have time to get into. So I'm glad that the question came up. Power matters. Uh, generally, the higher the power, the higher the, the electricity and the higher the, the uh, magnetic field is going to be. However, this comes back to one of the points I made on, on methods of reducing magnetic fields, and that is by increasing the voltage. And by way of reference, a, a typical uh, power line that is carrying 50 megawatts is probably in most situations going to be at a lower voltage, call it you know, something like 115 kilovolts. Whereas a project that's going to be carrying 400 or 1,000 megawatts is generally going to be at a much higher voltage. And so in many cases, it's not necessarily the power that matters. Uh, it's the, the combination of power and voltage such that at the end of the day, what you care about is how much current is flowing in that line. So, Power is equal to voltage times current. So as you increase the voltage, the current will go down. And so in many situations, that larger power transfer of 400 or 500 megawatts may end up resulting in lower magnetic field levels than you will see from a lower, uh, lower wattage project, uh, simply because they're operating at a higher voltage. Thank you. So this is another two part question combining a number of questions that I'm seeing here. With so much consistency in the conclusions of health and scientific agencies around the world, why do you think there are still misconceptions about the health research and magnetic fields? And then part two is, um, do you have recommendations for effective ways of simplifying and translating these concepts for a lay person to better understand? Sure, I'll, I'll start us off um, so Ben and Bill can think too. Um, in terms of, you know, misconceptions and, and why there's there's still so much, so many questions and so much research in this area. Um, I think first, you know, we should think back to Dr. Bailey's slide about the complexity of magnetic fields and the challenges with understanding them. Um, you know, we cannot see, feel, or hear EMF, so people may think of it differently from other exposures they may be familiar with. We're also surrounded by EMF in our daily lives. So it's an exposure that billions of people have every day. Um, and partially because of these factors, you know, EMF has garnered a lot of tension over the years and is now a well-studied exposure with a large body of research published in this area. Um, there is a tendency sometimes, particularly in the media, to focus on a single study or a set of studies and discuss it as if it represents the entire body of research. And as I discussed earlier, it's not a scientifically valid approach to rely on only a single study or a subset when forming overall conclusions on an exposure and outcome relationship. Each and every individual study will vary in the methods used by the researchers, will vary in the interpretations and conclusions of the authors, and will vary in the strengths and weaknesses of the overall study design. And that is why it is so important to look at the overall body of research when evaluating the scientific evidence on any topic. Um, and that, again, is what these health and scientific organizations I've discussed earlier. Um, and again, they've all been very consistent and that none have concluded that EMF causes adverse health effects. Um, as for the second part of the question, I mean, this is, this is a great point. Um, this is a challenging and complex topic to, um, to speak to. And, uh, you know, there's a, a few kind of things we've discovered over the years that can really help 
um, you know, first just acknowledging that this is a stakeholder concern during project development and providing objective and up to date information as early and as often as possible can really go a long way towards that dialogue. And then kind of taking the time as if we, we did as if as we did here to characterize EMF exposures, describe EMF, put it into context with other exposures in our communities and that we experience throughout the day. Um, and then, you know, these, again, these health and scientific organizations, the reports and the summaries of the reports that they provide on their websites can be a great source of information when looking to provide accurate and complete um, summary of, of the research to date. And I'll invite Ben or Bill if they have anything to add there. Thanks, Ben. I, I think you hit the highlights really well. Um, I think some of the best ways of helping people understand it or to try and put things into context as we tried to do here, uh, understanding what other sources there are for different types of electric and magnetic fields and how the fields from the power lines we're discussing relate to those sources. Um, it can take a little bit of time to have a chance to go through that and look at the different sources and kind of understand them a little bit, uh, but hopefully that context will also help people understand them a little bit better. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question. I know that we are at 2 o'clock, but I've received a number of questions um, trying to make sense of specific real world examples. So I'm going to pose one of them to you as our way of kind of speaking to all of them to close us out. Right? So based on the curves that you've showed us in the presentation about how the magnetic field dissipates as you move away from the source, here is one hypothetical, right? If a home is located off of a roadway that has an offshore transmission line buried in that roadway and the home is 30 to 50 feet away from the roadway, can you give us an indication of the level of magnetic field at that home uh, given that distance? Has it dissipated enough to be, uh, I think your wording was consistent with background levels, or is there some significant measurable impact at that distance? Um, I'll start with that a little bit, and, and I think it's a good question. As I said on the slide describing these projects and, and trying to provide a summary, every project is going to be a little bit different. Uh, how the duct bank is designed, uh, the separation distance between the cables, how many, how many cables are in a duct bank, how much power is flowing, all of these things are going to affect the field levels. Um, but I think universally it is fair to say that the field levels will decrease very quickly with distance. Uh, at a distance of 30 to 50 feet away, um, I would say that it's, it's likely that those field levels are going to be within the range of other types of sources that you will have in your community in those locations, whether that's an always on source, like the distribution lines we've talked about a couple of times, or maybe even uh, household appliances, um, or whether it's kind of a, a looking at what the field levels are inside a home. Uh, there have been surveys that have done that have been done across the U.S. In, in the past that have looked at field levels inside a home, and those can often range from uh, you know a fraction of a milligauss, maybe half a milligauss, up to uh, several three or five milligauss as the average background in a particular home. So those ranges, I think, are going to be consistent with what we would see from here. Um, and I apologize, Jan, I forgot the second part of that question. I think you covered it. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this learning from the experts webinar and thank you to our speakers for offering their time and their expertise. A reminder that the webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on NYSERDA's website. Our next webinars in the series are on November 7th and November 20th. Please visit wind.ny.gov to register for those. Uh, we encourage you to check out the past webinars in the series on NYSERDA's website and YouTube channel. And finally, if you have requests for future topics you'd like to hear about in this series, please email us at offshorewind at ny.gov or fill out the survey posted on our website. Thank you very much for joining us today and we'll see you next time.